welcome to the final program in a year-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of this new school, Institute for Retired Professionals. I'm Michael Markowitz, and I'm lucky enough to be the director and be associated with some of the most challenging, stimulating people uh, that you can imagine. Today we celebrate a remarkable 50 years with the new school. Music has been part of our rich heritage from the, the days of Deems Taylor and Aaron Copeland and Martha, and Martha Graham. First on the program will be Annette Fidler, an IRP student who served on the 50th anniversary program to tell us about the music for the occasion. And then our speaker will uh, be introduced by D uh, David Scobie, our dean. Miriam, I'm sorry, <laughs> Annette Fidler. <laughs> Annette Fidler. I see a number of people wave their cell phones at Michael to remind him to please turn them off. So please turn your, please turn your cell phones off. How many of you were here last October for the opening program? Wow, many of you. Well, I think you'll agree that that was a very special afternoon. And a good part of what made it special was the premiere of a piece that was commissioned by the IRP in celebration of our 50th anniversary. Today, we have the privilege of hearing what David Zimpedes, the composer, calls the second half or the continuation of the premiere. Uh, the piece, which is called a fanfare we would be, we will be building, we would be building, sorry, uh, was composed, as I said, by David Zimpedes, a member of the composition faculty and coordinator of new music and composition activities at Manus College, the new school for music. A Ford Foundation fellow, he has also been the director since 1999 of the widely respected composition program at California Summer Music in Sonoma and a founding member of the New York-based composers group, Music Under Construction. In his artist statement, David wrote, some decades ago, I came across a poem we would be building, clearly intended as a text for a hymn, written in the early 20th century by a little known figure named Perd Dietz. The text haunted me, and I eventually wrote a hymn to which it could be sung. It was sung once and then shelved. When I accepted the commission from the IRP, the poem awakened from its decades-long slumber and materialized before me. The poem must surely describe the attitudes and proud achievements of the IRP over the last 50 years. I can only hope that now, in its new guise, my hymn tune will find new life and live on to inspire good people everywhere to continue their work and to continue building. The piece will be played by students from Manus College and reflects a unique and nurturing relationship between the IRP and divisions of the new school. The students' names are listed in your program, but I think they deserve special mention. So if the students would come out, where are you? It's Bruno Lorenzetto and Melanie Gold on trumpets, Alexander Chin on horn. Oh, I'm sorry, David Flaum on horn. <laughs> Last minute change. Uh, Jasper Lynn on trombone, and Christopher Smith on tuba. Ladies and gentlemen, we would be building. Thank you. 
Isn't that wonderful? I'm, I'm sure that the committee that worked on this, uh, scores of people along with uh, Annette Fiddler, had such pleasure in dealing with the composer and that they really, we all came away with something very, very special. And it's so nice to hear our music. <laughs> For the, Next part of the program, David Scobie, Dean of the New School, will introduce our guest. There will be a brief question and answer period. And then we invite you to join us after the program in a celebratory toast. David Scobie is Executive Dean of the New School for Public Engagement since 2010. He is known as a national leader in developing innovative academic programs to create connections between institutions of higher education and communities outside the academy. He is founder and former director of the University of Michigan's Arts of Citizenship program, a program that seeks to integrate 
civic engagement in the liberal arts curriculum. Uh, he is on the board of Project Pericles, an organization that encourages universities to include civic engagement as part of undergraduate education. David's own scholarship explores po po politics, culture, and space in 19th century America. He's taught at the University of Michigan for 16 years and holds a PhD in American Studies from Yale. He, and it also holds a diploma in social anthropology from Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholarship, as a Rhodes Scholar. Our Dean, David Scobie. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I'm not going to say again, how proud I am of our connection to the Institute for Retired Professionals because I see many familiar faces and you've heard me say that five or six times over the course of this 50th uh, year uh, celebration. It's been a wonderful year and a, and a fitting commemoration for the vibrancy and the sustenance uh, and the creativity uh, of the IRP. So I'm, I'm I was delighted to help open this celebration, and I'm delighted to be here to kind of celebrate with a close, although I have a feeling I won't be able to stay long enough to, to drink the booze and have the toast, uh, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, before I introduce our, our terrific uh, and distinguished speaker today, uh, I also want to repeat my own personal thanks to our Manus musicians and to the planning uh, committee that, that brought them here. It was really kind of the new school at its best. I want to give a shout out to my colleague and friend Pam Tillis in the back and her staff who plan and stage all these events. And I want to say a special thank you to Michael, uh, who is always the person at this podium introducing and thanking uh, everyone else. Uh, at many of you I know work hard with him to lead and to organize uh, and to self-organize uh, the IRP. And, and my appreciation goes out to you, but especially him for his stalwart leadership of the IRP. <laughs> it's a wonderful occasion uh, today, commemorating this, the, 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 the culmination of this year of 50th uh, anniversary celebrations. And we have a, a wonderful speaker uh, to be part of that commemoration. Uh, Ira Katz Nelson is president of the Social Science Research uh, Council, and he's the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History uh, at Columbia University. He completed his PhD in history, I'm proud to say, at the University of Cambridge in 1969. Um, he has lived much of and studied the politics of much of the same period that spans the history of the IRP. He taught for many years at the University of Chicago, where he chaired the Department of Political Science. As many of you may know, he was here at the New School between 1983 and 1994, uh, and he was the dean of the graduate faculty, what we now call the New School for Social Research, uh, from uh, 1983 to 1989. Uh, in 1994, he joined uh, the faculty at Columbia, where, as I said, he's currently the, presently the, the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History. He has many honors and many uh, examples of, of academic and intellectual leadership. He was president of the American Political Science Associ Association uh, in 2005 and 6. Uh, he was president of the Social Science History Association. He's written or co-authored many books, more than a dozen, many of them uh, prize winning, including such titles as City Trenches, Urban Politics and the Patterning of Class in the United States, Working Class Formation, 19th Century Patterns of, in Western Europe and the United States, Marxism in the City, most recently Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time. And I gave some of those early titles uh, for two reasons. Because, and I'm speaking here as an urbanist and a historian myself, these titles bring me back to my own career uh, as uh, an aspiring intellectual and scholar. They were enormously important to me. I studied them. I taught them. 
I was lucky enough to be in conferences and workshops with Ira as a young academic. And for me, he embodied the kind of mix of expansive scholarship and public intellectual work that I aspired uh, to do myself as, as I made my own way. So this is kind of a personal note of, of thanks and a, appreciation. That's, that's reason number one for all those titles. Reason number two is you can tell uh, that they capture the intellectual terrain and the, and the political engagement that's right at the heart of the new school. It's, it's no surprise that he was here for a long stretch of his uh, career. He embodies our own values and aspirations intellectually, and so it's a real treat to have him back here today. Well, talk about treats. That was uh, an excessively kind and gracious introduction. Um, David just said some very nice things about me. Um, I won't let this moment pass without mentioning his scholarship on that has richly connected uh, architecture, landscape, urban history. Um, I love his book, uh, Empire City, on the making of uh, landscape of New York City, and anyone here who has not yet read uh, David's work um, should rush uh, at least to Amazon.com and buy, uh, <laughs> buy em and now, but I, I can't begin without um, saying some things about um, the IRP and about my dear friend uh, Michael Markowitz. I arrived here um, at the new school in 1984. Uh, Michael had arrived just the prior year, I believe. Um, I thought of him as a wise veteran. Um, he was then, he is now. Um, and if you're as wise today as you were then, you're, you have much wisdom. Um, and I suspect that some three decades later, um, your wisdom has grown. But not just your wisdom, the, um, a program that was then relatively small, new, two decades old, but still fledgling, has grown into arguably the single most um, inviting, rich, deep, intellectual, challenging site for uh, inquiry, for scholarship, for imagination, for those of us um, who have passed a certain um, moment in our uh, own personal trajectories. Um, Michael, dear Michael, thank you very much. Now, one last uh, preliminary, uh, this institution. Um, I still call it the New School for Social Research as a whole, um, and I won't call it New School University, um, <laughs> which it no longer is called. Um, but ever since 1919, when it was founded in a response to and in revulsion against um, uh, constraints on intellectual and academic freedom during the First World War. Um, ever since, a group of such estimable scholars as uh, John Dewey and the historian James Harvey Robinson, and then in the 1920s, uh, Aaron Copeland, Martha Graham, um, found a place here for the freest of creative expression, followed by the rescue of uh, refugee intellectuals that founded what became first the university in exile, then the graduate faculty in 1933, um, there has truly been no finer beacon of uh, humane intellectual life anywhere. Um, so it was an enormous privilege for me to have uh, labored here and worked here. Um, but I continue to think of myself entirely at home uh, at this great institution. Now, my, my subject um, is, this talk is drawn from um, a book I published just the other month um, called Fear Itself, uh, the, the subtitle, somewhat pretentious subtitle, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time. Um, it was published 
on um, another anniversary date, on um, the 4th of March of this year, which is precisely the 80th anniversary of Franklin Roosevelt addressing the American people and famously talking about fear itself. Um, there are not just tens of books and articles, uh, but many thousands of books and articles about the New Deal era. Why write another? Um, well, I was inspired in part to write another by an essay written by one of the leading historians, arguably the leading historian of the New Deal, the late Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who, as I'm sure most of you know, was the author of um, three beautifully realized volumes called The Age of Roosevelt. And in, shortly before his death, in February 2007, Professor Schlesinger reminded us in the New York Review of Books, and I quote, all historians are prisoners of their own experience, servitors to their own prepossessions. And he recalled that his own three volumes on the age of Roosevelt had been, quote, conditioned by the passions of my era. And he then wrote, conceptions of the past are far from stable. They are perennially revised by the urgencies of the present. When new urgencies arise in our own times and lives, the historian's spotlight shifts, probing now into the shadows, throwing into sharp relief things that were always there, but that earlier historians had carelessly excised from collective memory. New voices ring out of the historical darkness and demand attention. And I discovered um, in a file the other day, this will shock um, my dear old friend David Gold, who's known me since 1969, that I actually found something in an old file. Um, uh, uh, I found notes that I made after reading um, that text by Arthur Schlesinger. I decided to look for some voices that might surprise um, when we think about the New Deal. And here, this is notes from 2007 written in a quality of handwriting that almost prevented me from leaving primary school. Um, <laughs> but uh, here were just four, three or four voices that called out to me and helped motivate the writing of this book. First, Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann, arguably the country's most important um, journalist, op-ed writer before the phrase was even used, columnist, um, 1939, uh, June 5th, 1939. Three times, he wrote, in these 20 years, the American people have had great hope. Three times they have been greatly disappointed. Shocked me. 1939, this is not 1933, this is six years into the New Deal, America's leading journalist is writing about disappointment. And what three disappointments did he have in mind? Um, first was the aftermath of the First World War, a war that um, many thought at the time, certainly President Wilson thought at the time, um, would lead to an efflorescence of global democracy. By 1939, the world knew that wasn't true. Um, uh, most famously, the collapse of Weimar, the rise of Hitler, but not just the collapse of Weimar and the rise of Hitler. More than 20 constitutional democracies toppled uh, in the 1920s and 1930s in Europe, in East Asia, in Latin America. The second great disappointment Lippmann was referring to was the promise of great persistent prosperity of the 1920s. Um, of course, the great crash of 1929. And in 1939, still something like 15% of Americans were unemployed. Um, roughly twice the percentage we're at today. But the third disappointment, Lippmann said, was the New Deal. Now, you'll see that I don't think of the New Deal as a great disappointment, but it still was a voice that called out and demanded some explanation. Second voice. Um, from the past. This is uh, very different. Um, James Eastland, 
United States Senator from Mississippi, later um, Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, so not a trivial um, member of Congress. 1944, um, January 31st, 1944. Before I read you what he said, let me tell you what the context was. Uh, 1944, uh, we all know, was a year of uh, war, a decisive year of war. Um, some months, not many months, after the end of January, it's the beginning of June, um, we have uh, D-Day. Um, and uh, American troops, by the time of the election of 1944, uh, perhaps some people in the room, were spanned um, fighting in Europe, others on ships in all over the Pacific. Um, we had something like 12 million um, soldiers and sailors under arms in 1944. Question, how should they vote? Should they vote? Well, who could say they shouldn't vote? Um, people risking their lives for the country. And President Roosevelt proposed that every soldier in the field be handed a ballot in which, because they couldn't write for absentee ballots, and they should write in Roosevelt or Dewey, who was the Republican candidate for president. Um, the bill that passed Congress was not the bill that came out of the White House. It was a bill authored, co-authored, by uh, James Eastland of Mississippi and John Rankin of Mississippi. And this is how Senator Eastland explained the reasoning behind his bill. I quote, precise quote, these boys are fighting to maintain the rights of the states. These boys are fighting to maintain white supremacy. The floor of the U.S. Senate and the bill that passed did create a federal ballot, but the ballot was only to be counted in those states of the Union whose legislatures and governor voted to approve um, the use of the federal ballot. And the reasoning of Eastland and Rankin was that of the 12 million soldiers under arms, one million were African American, they didn't get to vote at home. Why should they now get to vote by virtue of being um, abroad? Well, that voice cried out and demanded attention, a voice that really had not, the kind of voice that if you read really the tens, the hundreds, the thousands of New Deal histories, um, there is, of course, reference to the South um, in these works, but it tends to be peripheral, a footnote story, not a story that we would want to think about, about how the southern wing of the Democratic Party constituted um, some of the core, helped constitute some of the core judgments taken, like this judgment about soldier voting in 1944. Third voice um, uh, calling out, um, now I have to read my handwriting more carefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is um, actually, it's, it, it's, I'll read it, it's, it, I know it by heart, but it's in the book. It's, um, uh, it, it's the aphorism at the very front of it, the writer, great writer, E.B. White. Um, a letter to the New York Herald Tribune, um, November 29th, 1947. I live in an age of fear. 1947, not 1929 or 33, but 1947. And that, that voice jumped out at me because um, the way in which New Deal historians have largely written, and I'm simplifying, maybe caricaturing, largely written about the period, um, much as Arthur Schlesinger wrote about the period, was of an arc starting in fear, the fear generated by the extraordinary collapse of market capitalism, not just here but globally, um, producing a peak of 25 percent unemployment when Roosevelt took, took office. By the way, as a footnote, academics love footnotes, the um, uh, 25 percent unemployment then meant more than it would now because most women were not in the wage labor force. So to have 25 percent unemployment meant that something approaching 50 percent of families in America were, out with, were without a wage um, uh, coming in. But so the, the typical New Deal uh, history will write of an arc that begins with fear, but says Schlesinger at the end of his uh, third volume, by 1936, hope had been restored. Um, 
the New Deal had demonstrated through its quite brilliant legislative achievements, National Industrial Recovery Act, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the 1935 Wagner Act, the Social Security Act, and many others, a regulation of Wall Street and the like, that um, fear could be stared down and hope restored. But here we were in 1947, E.B. White saying, I live in an age of fear. And the final voice that called out, at least in these resurrected notes of uh, some six years ago, um, President Eisenhower at his inauguration day in 1953. Science, he said, seems ready to confer on humanity as its final gift the power to erase human life from this planet. Dwight Eisenhower, 1953. Um, and it struck me that um, in reading that, that the integration of new layers, new sources of fear that took place during the 1930s and 1940s had not been sufficiently, sufficiently incorporated into our understanding of the, ninth, of the way historians have written about the 1930s and 1940s. Most historians tend to separate out. The domestic historians write about the domestic New Deal. The international relations specialists write about the origins of the Second World War or the Cold War. Others are weapons specialists and write about atomic weapons and about American and Soviet power. But these tend to sit in separate zones. And it occurred to me it might be useful to try to bring them together. So as um, I tell you a bit about the book, um, uh, bear in mind these voices, voices of, about fear, about disappointment, um, uh, about uh, white supremacy, um, uh, about danger. Now, the book was not just motivated by these voices. The reason these voices were um, compelling to me uh, was uh, precisely because of the urgencies of our time. Um, think of what Schlesinger said about how um, we deal with urgencies as historians that arise in our own times and our own lives. Um, my decision to write Fear Itself was uh, motivated in significant degree by um, present day economic volatility, global religious zealotry, military insecurity, and other sources that create a fearful environment. Um, I wrote to try to better understand the relationship joining democracy and fear. Now, I'm not, I would not claim that our current age has produced anxieties of the same magnitude as those of the 1930s and 1940s but I believe we're being tested in similar ways. And by exploring how the New Deal dealt with such challenges, the book tries to probe not just its achievements, but the cost of doing what was necessary to preserve liberal democracy and protect its values. The book investigates fear in democracy by offering four shifts in perspective. Um, and what I decided to do here, given the character and quality of uh, intellectual range of this audience, is not summarize a book simply substantively, but to, to hold up to view some of the key analytical decisions I made in writing it, trying to connect the, the visible content to the somewhat less visible um, set of analytical choices um, I found myself making uh, as I decided to tackle the history of the New Deal. And I really want to focus on four shifts in perspective that um, uh, are marked in this, in this volume. The first of them is an extension in time. Um, by the words New Deal in this book, I mean something that ordinarily would be called New Deal plus Fair Deal, or uh, Roosevelt plus Truman. Um, for three reasons uh, that I undertake a longer time frame than most New Deal histories. 
Um, the first is, 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 is so simple and obvious as to not bear saying, but I'll say it anyway. Um, Harry Truman was Franklin Roosevelt's last vice president. Um, he would never have been president of the United States if not for um, his place in the Roosevelt uh, New Deal. And moreover, related to that, the 20 years of uh, Democratic presidents, uh, Roosevelt and Truman, constitute something of a coherent partisan unit of time in which the presidency was dominated by the Democratic Party and the Congress, for all but two of those years, uh, was also uh, dominated in both houses by the Democratic Party. So this is a coherent political period, even in partisan terms. But that's not the most important reason for extending um, uh, in time. The second um, uh, reason has to do with the nature of fear. If we look across the full 20-year period, start when um, Roosevelt took his oath of office, March 4th, 1933, to the inauguration in late January, the 20th of January, we then shifted from a J March to a January inaugural date, um, when Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated uh, in 1953. If we look at that full arc, we see a remarkable layering of fearful and fear-inducing circumstances. Just think first of the remarkable collapse of the economy. But simultaneous to the collapse of the economy was the extraordinary rise of a new type of competing dictatorship. They were different from each other uh, uh, internally. The dictatorship in Berlin was not identical to the previous fascist one in Rome, nor was the one in Rome hardly identical in all respects to the regime that took power after the Bolshevik Revolution in Moscow. But by 1933, each of those young, and in the case of Hitler, very young um, uh, regimes, um, represented an entirely new kind of dictatorship. Um, a dictatorship that dared call itself democratic because it claimed to be representing the mass of the population, whether it was the German race or the Soviet working class or the Italian nation. These were very different kinds of mass claims than had traditionally been made by monarchies, uh, traditional autocracies. And these new governments each claimed they could solve problems better than the liberal democracies. They didn't have a complicated legislative process. They didn't have polarized politics. They didn't have money buying political influence. And they had a strong sense of public interest for the race, for the class, for the nation, compared to the effete uh, claims of the liberal democracies, including the United States. These alternative regimes were fear-inducing, not just because of their own behavior, but because of the challenge they posed to liberal democracy. And the last reason for, so we see that layering of fear, and followed by the violence of the Second World War, ending with atomic weapons, followed by the discovery of the Holocaust, followed by the Cold War that culminates in a hot war in Korea. And each of these moments challenged the existing status quo. These were unprecedented developments. And I think they represent a, a kind of each on its own, but especially together, represent a fear-inducing climate of a kind that had not ever been seen before or perhaps even after. We all take risks. We all take chances in life. Um, you buy a house, you marry, you, you don't, it's a chance. Um, uh, but when we do those things, we're pretty sure that we can assess the probabilities of success. Uh, we buy a home because we think we bought it in the right time, the right way, it'll go up in value sooner or later. We could be wrong. Um, we marry, we wager, we know that about half the marriages don't last, but we think ours will, um, and, uh, and so on. Um, but fear-inducing circumstances, 
occur in situations where we can't even reckon the risks. Um, when something so radical happens, like the collapse of the economy or atomic weaponry, um, there's no prior set of uh, long examples that we can look to to know what the risks are. And when we face circumstances where we can't assess the risk, we become afraid. And that's how fear is generated. And we see that across the arc of these 20 years. And finally, the, with respect to the first of these decisions, by extending time through the Truman administration, we can see an outcome that might not have been so clear had we or I stopped earlier. Um, by 1952, the United States had developed, during these 20 years, a new kind of national state in Washington of the sort that had never existed before. Um, it had two sides to it. And I'll, for want of time, but happy to talk more about it later, we'll, we'll give a, a, sort of a, a caricatured version. Um, on the one side, on the domestic side, we had an enormous upsurge in um, scale and responsibilities of the federal government. Um, much of it uh, to build security for people like us. Um, uh, that new state, with a much larger budget than it had had in 1930 um, or 32, um, a state with many more public responsibilities, was a state that also brought new claimants to Washington wanting a piece of the pie. Um, the lobbying state, the interest group state, uh, dates from that period. And that, is, that side of the state, which we still live with, is very strong on procedures. It's hard to pass a law, for example. Um, it's thick with procedures for lobbying, for influence, um, for votes in Congress. But it's very thin, deliberately so, um, in a sense of a single public interest. That is, the public interest at any time is the outcome of the political process. We pass Obamacare. That's the public interest. If a Republican government were to come, had come to power, uh, if President Romney had been elected, if he had been President Romney, Governor Romney, with a Republican Congress, um, he had promised day one in office, I'm going to try to repeal Obamacare. Our democratic politics is a provisional politics about the public interest. And that's a good thing um, in the sense that unlike dictatorships, it's, we play a provisional game. Um, strong on procedures, weak on public interest. But we have another side to the national state that emerged by the end of the 1940s, a national security state, a kind of crusading state um, that was very strong on public interest and very weak on <coughs> procedures, uh, exactly the inverse. Um, the United States fights for democracy in the world, fights against dictatorship, fights for human rights. These are statements of strong public interest, but without almost any procedural constraints. If a president of the United States decides, and I'm not arguing it wasn't a good decision, to drop an atomic bomb uh, on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, the president can do that. It doesn't go through the normal democratic process. It's not thick with procedures. If a president of the United States decides to order a drone to kill um, an American citizen in Yemen, that doesn't require democratic procedures. Um, could be the right decision, could be the wrong decision. My only point is the, the national state that has both sides, like the Roman god Janus, um, was created as early as the late 1940s with the National Security Act, with um, Atomic Energy Act with the CIO, with the National Security CIA and the National Security Council, as well as the interest group domestic state. By 1952, the world we live in, the origins of our time, can be found then. So that's why I extended the timing. Let me go more quickly. Um, the second decision is that of situating the New Deal in global context. I've already talked about that. Uh, this was an era of dictatorships. Um, an era in which the critics of democracy, as well as many friends of democracy, argued that liberal democracies like the United States, representative democracies with parliaments, with Congress at its core, 
could not solve the big problems of the day. Capitalism, labor, might, uh, internal order, and national security because they were too divided, too fragmented, too polarized. The dictatorships knew how to do that. And here's Walter Lippmann again, um, making just this point and making a proposal in February, um, one month before the inauguration, February 1933. The situation, Lippmann wrote, requires strong medicine. He advocated a grant of, quote, extraordinary powers to the incoming president. The danger we have to fear is not that Congress will give Franklin Roosevelt too much power, but that it will deny him the power he needs. The danger is not that we shall lose our liberty, but that we shall not be able to act with the necessary speed and comprehensiveness. And then he proposed, we should give the president, I'm quoting, for a period of a year, the widest and fullest powers under the most liberal interpretation of the Constitution. Congress should suspend temporarily the rule of both houses to limit drastically the right of amendment and debate to put the majority under the decisions of the Democratic Party caucus. Well, we don't ordinarily suspend Congress and so on. Um, and he said the supersession of normal politics is the necessary thing to do. If the American nation des desires action and results, that's the way to get them." End quote. Now, this was not an abstraction. In 1922, when Mussolini came to power, the first thing done uh, after the March on Rome was have the, 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 the Italian parliament vote to suspend its capacity to legislate and give it to the executive branch. Adolf Hitler, 19 days after the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt, had the Reichstag vote a so-called enabling act to enable the executive branch to carry out all legislation and to suspend the Reichstags, the parliament's uh, power. Well, here was Lippmann in a democracy proposing a soft version of the same kind of thing. And then when we see that by situating the New Deal in global context, we see this, this source of fear. The third shift is a shift from primary attention to the president and the executive branch, the great figures of Roosevelt and Truman, to Congress. And I shifted to Congress um, because Congress was thought to be the problem. Think of what Lippmann had just said. So the question then is, how did Congress meet the challenges of the time? Because Congress did meet the challenges of the time. Now, it, let me just say before turning to Congress um, that the new president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, at his inauguration, um, uttered some sentences which have mostly been forgotten. We all remember the nothing to fear but fear itself. We don't remember the following. Our Constitution is so simple and practical, he said, that it's possible always to meet extraordinary needs by changes in emphasis and arrangement without loss of essential form. And he then flirted with Lippmann's extra constitutional proposals. The president voiced misgivings about the ability of Congress to cope, and he cautioned, and I quote, how it may be, I'm quoting Roosevelt, that an unprecedented demand and need for undelayed action may call for temporary departure from that normal balance of public procedure. Should Congress not act promptly and decisively, he warned, and I'm quoting, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. Um, that's, a, that's, that's not a simple passage to read from the President of the United States. The great thing about the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal is that step was never taken. Congress was never suspended. Um, there was no shift to executive power. Of all the New Deal's accomplishments, none was more important than the demonstration that liberal democracy, a political system with a legislature at its heart, could govern effectively in the face of great danger. Congress passed law after law after law. Uh, America was changed by legislation, not simply by executive fiat. And that is an enormous achievement. It, 
It basically said implicitly to the dictatorships, you can have a democracy that works by procedural rules. Even the famous 100 days where gigantic bills were written in the White House, passed with only two or three hours of debate, um, still were influenced um, by Congress. The one example, the National Industrial, or one example of many, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which put most of the economy under the control of the federal government for a period, um, added public works. Um, many of us don't, didn't, or at least I didn't remember, that initially President Roosevelt did not want public works as part of the New Deal. Um, but Congress said, we won't pass this bill unless you give people jobs through public works. Um, and it was Congress that uh, pushed the administration um, to violate its own rules of fiscal austerity or probity um, in order to create um, public employment jobs. That's just one example. But Congress, in short, was not a casualty of the country's crises, but an instrument that sought to overcome them. And that brings me to the last shift in emphasis, a shift from within Congress to the American South. Much of this book concerns how the American South, in the last era of Jim Crow, uh, in the years just coming up to the Brown v. Board decision of 1954, continued to shape um, the nature of the country as a whole. Now, the South, we should remember, um, wasn't just the 11 states that seceded from the Union in uh, the beginning of the Civil War. The South, until 1954, consisted of 17 states that mandated racial segregation mandated racial. Ironically, the Brown v. Board decision was a Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Kansas did not mandate as a state racial segregation. It gave each city the option of whether to segregate its schools or not, and Topeka had chosen that option. But we had 17 states where even if a local authority said we want to racially integrate our schools, they weren't permitted to do it. And those 17 states were identical to the 17 that banned interracial marriage as late as 1967, when the Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional in Loving v. Virginia to ban interracial marriage. And they were exactly the same states that practiced slavery before the Civil War. We had 15 states that practiced slavery. And then the, you get to 17 when you note that West Virginia broke off from Virginia, and Oklahoma became a state only in the early 20th century. So from the founding of the Republic, certainly through the New Deal era, we had a part of this country devoted, it's not a polemical statement, it's a descriptive statement, devoted to the principles of white supremacy. Um, now, this South politically had huge advantages in Washington. Um, first of all, 17 states is 34 United States senators in what was then a Senate of 96 seats. Any block of 34 votes can filibuster and stop any piece of legislation. Then, now. Um, this block of 34 senators, not always exclusively Democratic, because in the Hoover landslide, for example, of 1928, uh, five Republicans were elected to the Senate from the South in a kind of anti-Catholic um, impulse. But 1940, to pick a year, every U.S. Senator um, below the Mason-Dixon line was a Democrat. So you have 34 Democrats, not one of whom ever, including the most liberal, like Claude Pepper, um, a, a hero of mine, not one in this period ever opposed racial segregation. Um, not one. Um, so they, and everyone, including such figures as the young Lyndon Johnson, who was not a racist, um, opposed any interference with what they called uh, the autonomy of the South to decide on its own way of life. So you have a, a part of the polity devoted to segregation and protecting it at the heart of the Democratic Party. More than half of every of the Democrats in the United States Senate and House after 1938 were Southern. And before 1938, 45% of the representatives in the Democratic Party in the first six years of Roosevelt were Southern. 
When they were a minority of the party, nothing could pass into law against their opposition. And when they were a majority of the party, everything that passed into law was designed to meet the contours of their preferences. But their preferences were complicated. They were not conservatives. They were liberals. They were progressives for white people. Um, they, the South was dirt poor. Um, in 1930, according to the census, only one third of Southerners who lived on the land, and most did, uh, had both running water and electricity in their homes. This was what third world country. Um, they were not smug uh, or pro big capital or anything like that. Um, they wanted government to take a forceful role um, and deal with poverty and other questions, provided race could be protected, their race system. So every key piece of legislation passed in the 1930s, including the Wagner Act and the Social Security Act, exempted, uh, or excluded rather, farm workers and maids. Um, if you were a domestic worker or you were a farm worker, you could not get Social Security until the 1950s. And that was because the Southerners insisted they be kept out, because that's what black people did. Um, black women who worked for a wage uh, worked in other people's houses, and uh, black men who worked for a wage worked on the land. Um, they were excluded, not by race, but by occupation. And I could go on at some length about that. I won't, because we're going to run out of time. Um, so after 1938, I would argue, I do argue, um, a South, and a South that became increasingly fearful of its own capacity to protect racism, began to navigate the alliance with the non-Southern wing of the Democratic Party with um, more apprehension. And the first place you begin to see Southerners bolting or leaving the normative position of the central Democratic Party um, was in labor questions. The, the Southerners voted for the Wagner Act that cr helped create the CIO, um, the legal framework for the CIO. They voted for the Wagner Act unanimously almost, almost unanimously in 1935 because they kept farm workers and maids out. But by the 1940s, that was no longer good enough. And by 1947, it was the South voting with a unanimous Republican bloc to overturn the veto of Harry Truman and support the Taft-Hartley bill, which cut the rights of labor substantially in order to guarantee that there would be no successful labor organizing in the South. Um, and I could, time permitting, could talk about other such policies. But the results on the domestic side, especially the truncation of labor, helped create the kind of um, interest group state where no single interest group has any particular privileges except business, really, um, uh, or various kinds of business that we live with today, the kind of state with um, weak public interest but strong procedures. But reciprocally, the South was critical, absolutely critical, and here I'll say a good word for some of the decisions taken in the period, uh, critical in building up the capacity of the United States to confront the dictatorships. Just one example, July 1941. Um, think of July 41. It's five months before Pearl Harbor. We were not at war, but Europe and Asia were at war. Um, uh, Japanese were all over China, um, and certainly Hitler um, had um, moved east. Um, and at that moment, Franklin Roosevelt uh, appealed to Capitol Hill, um, to Congress, to extend the peacetime draft. Um, in 1940, we had our first peacetime draft, um, but it was hedged with restrictions. Soldiers could not leave the Western Hemisphere. Soldiers could, would only be drafted for one year. Um, and because of those provisions, even those who were isolationists supported it, because the job of the army was to protect the Western Hemisphere, not to go to war against Hitler. But a year later, uh, Roosevelt said, this isn't good enough. The world's become much more dangerous. We can't live with just a one-year army. We need a, a more substantial armed force. 
and we need the ability to go outside the Western Hemisphere, potentially. The House of Representatives voted to support that proposal of Franklin Roosevelt, 203 to 202. Um, one vote. It doesn't take a huge counterfactual imagination to imagine 203 to 202 the other way. If that had happened, we would have entered Pearl Harbor with an army smaller than Belgium's. Um, and it would have taken quite some time to recruit, train, equip army and navy um, capable of fighting after we would have been attacked. Um, who voted for this bill? Um, not Republicans. They argued, um, again, I'm, some Republicans did, but in the great majority, not Republicans. And they argued a very principled argument. A peacetime draft is a threat to liberty. Um, we're not at war, they said. Why should we... Why should the state have the right to take our boys and put them under arms? Northern Democrats were split. Those who had British, Italian, and German, sorry, I back up, those who had Irish, Irish, German, and Italian constituents voted no. Um, Britain was at war. Britain was not exactly the, um, the great prize um, uh, to be protected if you were in, 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 in an Irish community. Um, and certainly, if you were German or Italian, however deeply loyal to the United States, you might have reservations about having your children drafted to potentially fight their first cousins. Um, so the, uh, about ha the northern wing of the Democratic Party was split. Um, only because a unanimous Southern bloc voted uh, in favor of a peacetime draft did we have one. So the Southern story is complicated. Um, it's complicated because it ultimately was the shaper of this dual state that we got and which we live with. So let me, um, let me end, and I'm happy to, I can go on and on if you like, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, academics do. I'll end by just reading the, the last two paragraphs of the introduction to this, the book. So if hi it reads as follows. If history plays tricks, Southern congressional power in the last era of Jim Crow was a big one. The ability of the New Deal to confront the era's most heinous dictatorships by reshaping liberal democracy required accommodating the most violent and illiberal part of the political system, keeping the South inside the game of democracy. While it would be folly to argue that members of the Southern wing of the Democratic Party alone determined the choices the New Deal made, their relative cohesion and their assessment of policy choices through the filter of an anxious protection of white supremacy often proved decisive. The triumph, in short, cannot be severed from the sorrow. Liberal democracy prospered as a result of an accommodation with racial humiliation and its system of lawful exclusion and principled terror. Each constituted the other like the united double nature of both soul and body in Goethe's Faust. This combination confers a larger message a lesson that concerns the persistence of emergency, the inescapability of moral ambiguity, and perhaps the inevitability of a politics of discomforting allies abroad as well as at home. It also reminds us that not just whether, but also how we find our way truly matters. Thank you very much. be very happy to um, take questions, but if you do, you must speak into a microphone. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a fear that things are receding uh, in our country. Uh, how can this be reversed and how can a different approach to government become po possible? <sighs> Well, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, the, uh, 
the question, are we receding, and then what can be done about it? Um, let, me, let me give a mixed report first. Um, there are some features. Um, let's take the 50-year span of uh, this great institution that we're celebrating. Um, 50 years ago, 1963. Um, 1963, the United States had not passed a Civil Rights Act. Um, in 1963, the United States had not yet passed a Voting Rights Act. In 1963, um, the women's movement um, was in very early days as a, a, a there had been older women's movements, but the modern women's movement was really just beginning to find full full force um, in a way that ultimately radically to the better transformed uh, life opportunities um, uh, for women. Um, uh, certainly in 1963, um, questions of sexuality and choice um, were not in a position that anyone could have even imagined that the issue of gay marriage would be debated, let alone um, legislated, and in, 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 in a subject now of Supreme Court deliberations, where we still don't know what going to happen. So in one, and let alone imagine, um, we found it very hard in 1963 still, we were taking in the fact that a Catholic had been elected in 1960, President of the United States. Um, none of us would have imagined, not just that there might be an African American president, but that we would have a Supreme Court with not one Protestant sitting on it, six <laughs> Catholics, three Jews. Um, the, um, on this dimension, I, on, well, let's call, I'll call it a dimension of social and human fairness. Um, the United States in the half century of the IRC um, has been radically transformed for the better. And in that sense, I don't think we're receding. Um, we're receding in some respects. We're, we may soon have a decision by the Supreme Court on uh, voting rights or another on affirmative action that is saying we've done enough. Um, I don't agree with that at all. Um, but the context within which those decisions are being taken um, is uh, dramatically different than it was 50 years ago. However, there are features that are worse than 50 years ago and shockingly worse, even in those dimensions that we've now um, that I've just mentioned. Our schools are more segregated today than they were 50 years ago. It's interesting um, and unsettling. Um, our neighborhoods not, but uh, they remain very heavily um, racially separated. Um, in, um, at the level of um, wages, there's been a closing of the gap uh, uh, over the long half century, um, certainly between whites and blacks, men and women, um, other minorities and majorities, because women are a majority. Um, uh, but there's been an astonishingly um, stubborn and now widening wealth gap between um, people of color and people who are not people of color. Um, in, and this largely can be traced to the history of real estate ownership. Um, in the 1940s, um, under the GI Bill, modern middle class, homeowning middle class, but it was formed, but I won't get into the long story now, but it, if you were black and in the South, you had very little access to home mortgage and so on. We had huge gaps in, um, in home ownership. There was a 10 to 1 a wealth ratio of um, uh, white to black in 2007. Today it's 20 to 1. Um, the, um, and at the same time, what we usually mean when talking about the country having troubles or going down or receding, um, at least on the domestic side, is the seeming Ill inability of Congress to get itself to do what the New Deal Congresses did, which is to pass laws that confront the big problems of our time. Um, and I think that's certainly um, right. Um, what to do about it, um, uh, I don't have uh, <laughs> solutions. I would say the following, that um, politics in Washington, uh, at least what I, what I called the 
procedurally thick and public interest thin side of the national state um, responds to pressures. And most of the pressures in the last decade or so have come from an organized right, more than uh, uh, the other side of the spectrum, and the political system has responded. Um, the, uh, if you could just compare Tea Party with all its weaknesses to occupation Wall Street that has disappeared, um, you have an asymmetry of mobilization um, and, and influence. So I, I don't think absent um, self-conscious organization, um, we will, for those of us who have particular political preferences, we'll see them uh, much satisfied. Um, final thing to say is that I think much of our, many of our problems on the domestic side um, are grounded in the near total collapse of a private uh, wage um, union uh, force. Um, the United States, in, when this institution was founded, um, more than 30 percent of private wage workers in the United States belong to unions. Today it's about six and a half to seven percent. Um, and that change uh, has changed the character of politics in Washington, has changed the nature of, of the wage relationship in many parts of the economy, um, has uh, enlarged inequality. And that, to me, is the growing inequalities, economic inequalities, which contradict uh, or are different than the social turn towards more equality, constitutes the, the world in which we're now, now living. Sorry to have gone on so long. That's a yeah. rich Professor? Question. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, no, yes. you. Yes, please. <laughs> Professor, um, first, thank you for an enormously stimulating talk. Thank this you. This has really uh, been great. You make a, uh, you make a good case for the fact that the seeds of the present crippling polarization in, in our Congress uh, were laid uh, with the Civil Rights Act and the uh, disbanding of the progressive coalition that you talked about through, throughout that 20-year uh, period. Um, where do you see the next coalition coming from? Uh, obviously, we're going to have to uh, get rid of this polarization at some point. And I suspect it'll have to be a coalition. Great question. Um, I, uh, uh, short answer, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, they, uh, um, not a much longer answer is to remind us that um, there was a time, 1950 is the date, you'll see why I, I point to, when um, the problem was not thought to be too much division between the parties but too much similarity between the parties. Um, in 1950, the American Political Science Association, of which I'm a proud member, um, uh, wrote a report um, called Toward a More Responsible Party System. And it argued that uh, I take that as a form of applause. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, It, it argued um, that democratic politics requires policy division, and therefore each election should be a real choice. And there's something to be said for that. Um, from my own um, uh, perspective, I think the issue is not um, that we have um, a wide spectrum of opinions about, say, the role of the state in domestic affairs. Um, I think that the key problems lie um, in the combination of inequality of access to the political system across the spectrum, coupled with a thickening of the procedures that are barriers to achieving any legislative outcome, um, that together um, have, have changed the environment over the last half century for, um, for effectively passing legislation. Last thing I'd say about this, yet another footnote, is to remind ourselves that the era when we thought we were so much less polarized, and there are measures political scientists have about polarization between the parties, where they narrow most was exactly the moment when Southern Democrats began to behave a little bit more like Republicans. So if you have half the Democratic Party as in the Taft-Hartley Act, voting with Republicans, that's the absence of polarization. Um, uh, 
So the only cautionary word is that as somebody who has polarized views, um, uh, we might also think about the substance of politics. And very last thing to be said about this is a big, another huge change in the last half century or a bit more is the separation out of normal democratic politics of much that goes under the heading of national security. Um, and this uh, seems to me is as vexing and tough a problem as polarization that faces our ability or inability to pass legislation. Uh, how, how we grapple with that, um, even if we think presidents are making just the right decisions, um, there are huge zones of of, of political decision making about fateful matters that are simply entirely separated out from ordinary democratic politics. Professor, in uh, Robert Caro's Master of the Senate, the third volume of the ongoing LBJ biography, he takes a long overview of Senate history and when he mentions what was then called uh, Roosevelt's court packing plan, and it's his opinion that once that was defeated, and Republicans realized that if they stuck together with conservative Democrats, they could block forever, which is in fact what Caro thinks happened, block forever the kind of legislative uh, progressive stuff that had happened earlier. Do you know whether FDR and his uh, staff had any big ideas going after that plan that they just couldn't get accomplished? Well, he did accomplish the fair minimum wage and maximum hours passed after court packing. Um, the, of course, the Second World War uh, came about. But then if you read um, Roosevelt's uh, um, uh, speeches in 44 um, to Congress, including his State of the Union, um, you'll discover um, that he articulated a very ambitious uh, uh, agenda looking forward. So I don't think, um, and of course, Harry Truman proposed um, uh, often couldn't succeed in getting it passed, but succeed, uh, proposed legislation. I want to say something that you didn't quite ask about the court packing, but is on my mind. Um, people sometimes ask me, um, uh, well, isn't court, the court packing proposal an example of Roosevelt as dictator? He's trying to change the concept. He was certainly accused of that. But I'd point out two things which are worth remembering, I think. First, our Constitution stipulates no particular size to the Supreme Court. Um, we've had courts that were, did not have nine members um, at different moments. And second, he proposed to Congress that they pass a law. They said no, it didn't happen. Um, uh, that seems to me is part of normal, not dictatorial um, uh, politics. And it was fair to accuse him of dictatorial um, ambitions in the sense of dictating a policy outcome but not dictating um, a constitutional um, transformation absent consent through normal uh, democratic procedures. So in any event, that wasn't your question, but I think it bears on the uh, court packing. Last, I'm I... Sorry, a final question. Final question. Ah, this is Michael telling me I'm, I'm, I'm going on too long. <laughs> He's been doing that for 30 years. <laughs> Have such things as the... Uh, Citizens United decision, the uh, mandate for almost 60 votes in the Senate, and, or one senator throttling legislation by putting in an objection or throttling the appointment of people to boards by the president and courts, has creating of safe districts in the House. Have these things brought the Walter Lippmann uh, concept of uh, reducing uh, in, into a sharper focus and more likelihood? What a good question. Um, uh, I just, my first impulse is to say, let's, let's celebrate and think at the same time about that question. Um, just one or two uh, very quick uh, uh, thoughts. First of all, the, it, it's not entirely true that this moment is unique um, uh, in, in the sense of degree, even degrees of polarization um, in terms of uh, the use of Senate rules uh, to inhibit legislation, um, the tightness in there are some res, in some respects, in some it's easier um, uh, to get a bill to become a law than it was at earlier periods because the power of committee barons has been lowered. Um, 
at least to a considerable extent as compared to the to earlier periods. There also were periods of, need I say, very high polarization, one of which culminated in a civil war. Um, so we, uh, uh, w in a larger context, we've survived such um, uh, moments in which rules plus polarization plus barriers um, uh, create a loss of confidence in the ability of Congress to function effectively. What's different this time is the loss of confidence and legitimacy by the an enormously great majority of the American people. We, every poll tells us, uh, you know, evaluate Congress, 11 percent say uh, we think positively or doing a good job. Uh, this was not true in 1950 or even, dare I, we don't know, in 1850. Um, so that should give us pause and remind us that the legitimacy of democratic government cannot always be taken for granted. Um, and we see this not just as a problem in the United States, but today in across much of democratic Europe where um, there's been a profound loss of faith. And I'll end by just citing an article that appeared in the Financial Times written by, I actually have it with me by accident. Um, no, I, I, by accident, truly. Um, uh, this was appeared in the Financial Times of March 1st, um, written by Mark Mazower, who's a very good historian, my colleague at Columbia, and he ends this way. He's a historian of Southern Europe, especially uh, Greece and um, the Balkans. For it is not written in stone that Europe will always be identified in the minds of its citizens with growth and democracy. A different future may lie ahead in which Europe is identified instead with stagnation, unemployment, and tyranny. Um, that's very, those are strong words. I don't know if they're right, but the, they would not have been written 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, so, and, they, and they could not be written yet about the United States. Um, but it reminds us that we too, in some critical ways, uh, just as E.B. White said, we too live in an age of fear. Thank you very much.